hast du dich auch schon mal gefragt, was kostet billiges Essen eigentlich wirklich? Woher die Ungleichheit in der Welt kommt und wie viel Wahrheit Demokratie braucht? Sind Digitalisierung und Demokratie überhaupt vereinbar? Kann man gesellschaftlichen Zusammenhalt messen? Und was heißt Entwicklung in Zeiten des Klimawandels? In diesem Jahr veranstalten wir erstmals das Digitale Wissenschaftsfestival GLOBE 21, um genau diesen Fragen auf den Grund zu gehen. Gemeinsam mit Forscherinnen und Forschern aus der ganzen Welt begeben wir uns mit dir auf eine Suche nach grenzüberschreitenden Solidaritäten in verschiedenen Regionen der Welt. Unsere Wissenschaftlerinnen und Wissenschaftler bieten ab dem 10. Juni, jeden Mittwoch, Donnerstag und Freitag, eine Vielzahl spannender Formate an. Angefangen bei Filmabenden und Gesprächen, Podcasts, Stadtführungen, Ausstellungen bis hin zu interessanten Podiumsdiskussionen oder Kurzvorträgen. Das Programm zum Festival findest du auf www.glob-festival.de Außerdem findest du uns unter dem Hashtag Bordercrossing Solidarities auf Facebook, Instagram und Twitter. Herzlich willkommen an diesem sommerlichen Freitagabend zu der Veranstaltung Ist Demokratie ohne Wahrheit möglich? Die Gupta Leaks, Populismus und gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt in Südafrika. Mein Name ist Konstanze Blum und ich bin wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin im Projekt Political Populism in Southern Africa. Das Projekt ist Teil des Forschungsinstituts gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt, kurz FGZ, und hier am Standort der Universität Leipzig angesiedelt. Thema des heutigen Abends wird sein Südafrika und die Frage nach der Stärke bzw. Fragilität des gesellschaftlichen Zusammenhalts. Wir freuen uns auf den Dokumentarfilm How to Steal a Country von dem südafrikanischen Regisseur Rehat Desai und auf das anschließende Gespräch mit ihm. Er wird sich aus Johannesburg zuschalten, wo es gerade täglich mehrmals Stromausfälle gibt. Er wird davon berichten. Und mit Professor Dr. Ulf Engel, Professor für Politik in Afrika an der Universität Leipzig. Die Veranstaltung heute findet in Kooperation mit Arte statt und wir freuen uns sehr, dass wir den Film im Rahmen dieses Festivals nutzen dürfen. Und noch eine kurze technische Information. Wenn Sie die Veranstaltung in Originalsprache verfolgen möchten, können Sie dies über den YouTube-Kanal tun. Wenn Sie gerne die Übersetzung hören möchten, können Sie sich über den Zoom-Link einloggen, den Sie auf der Veranstaltungswebseite finden. Gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt. Das ist ein zentrales Element unseres Veranstaltungstitels. Doch was bedeutet das eigentlich? In unserem Forschungsinstitut stellen wir uns genau dieser zentralen Frage. Und besonders spannend ist für uns in diesem Zusammenhang, bedeutet Zusammenhalt denn das Gleiche über Zeit und Raum hinweg? Hat also gesellschaftlicher Zusammenhalt oder der Klebstoff, der eine Gesellschaft zusammenhält, die gleiche Bedeutung in Simbabwe, in Südafrika, in Deutschland oder in den USA? Hat er die gleichen Eigenschaften in Berlin, der Lausitz und in Schwaben? Und unter welchen Bedingungen wächst das Gefühl der Zusammengehörigkeit? Wann schwindet es? Ich selbst habe Afrikanistik studiert, eine Zeit lang in Mosambik gelebt und bin nun in Berlin. Und die Frage nach den Besonderheiten verschiedener nationaler und regionaler Kontexte, wie zum Beispiel im südlichen Afrika, interessiert mich sehr. Südafrika und auch andere Länder in der Region, wie zum Beispiel Namibia oder Simbabwe, haben einiges gemeinsam. Diese Länder waren früher Siedlerkolonien. Das heißt, es gab und es gibt nach wie vor eine weiße Minderheit im Land, die sich als SüdafrikanerInnen, NamibiaInnen und ZimbabweInnen identifizieren. Die gesellschaftlichen Strukturen sind nach wie vor sehr stark vom Apartheidsystem geprägt einem politischen und wirtschaftlichen System, das auf Rassentrennung, Unterdrückung, Ausbeutung der schwarzen Mehrheitsgesellschaft zugunsten einer weißen Minderheit beruhte. Apartheid ging 1994 nach einem jahrzehntelangen Befreiungskampf zu Ende. 
Südafrika ist heute eine Demokratie mit einer Verfassung, die in der Region oft als Vorbild gilt. Doch die Vergangenheit wirkt nach. Zum Beispiel hat das Land aktuell eine Arbeitslosenquote von rund 43 Prozent. Und schwarze Südafrikanerinnen und Südafrikaner trifft es um ein Vielfaches mehr als ihre weißen Mitbürgerinnen und Mitbürger. Hier liegt die Quote bei ungefähr 8 oder 9 Prozent. Mehr als die Hälfte der Bevölkerung lebt unter der Armutsgrenze. Auch hier zum größten Teil die schwarze Bevölkerung. Kurz, Ungleichheiten bestehen weiterhin. Wie kann eine Gesellschaft unter solchen Bedingungen zusammenhalten? Wie gestalten sich Vertrauensverhältnisse zwischen Mitmenschen, die sich oftmals zu so fremd sind, zum Teil sogar immer noch räumlich getrennt voneinander leben, was zum Beispiel Wohnraum oder Schulen angeht? Dies ist keine leichte Frage. Tatsächlich kann sozialer Zusammenhalt oder das Gefühl einer bestimmten Gruppe anzugehören, aber nicht immer nur positive, sondern durchaus auch negative Auswirkungen haben. Die ausländerfeindlichen afrophoben Ausschreitungen gegen afrikanische Migrantinnen und Migranten aus Nachbarländern, die sich seit 2008 regelmäßig in südafrikanischen Großstädten wiederholen und die auch bei uns in Deutschland medial ähm, über die berichtet wurde, sind ein Beispiel hierfür. Neben dem Vertrauen oder der Solidarität zwischen Mitmenschen ist auch das Vertrauen in staatliche Institutionen ein Kernelement gesellschaftlichen Zusammenhalts. Also sozusagen dessen vertikale Dimension. Und in Südafrika verliert die Regierungspartei und frühere Befreiungsbewegung ANC zunehmend an Legitimität. Die Unterstützung in der Bevölkerung wird von Wahl zu Wahl weniger, die Wahlbeteiligung sinkt rapide. Die jüngere Generation, die sogenannten Born Free, die nach 1994 geboren wurden und so nicht selbst unter dem Apartheid-System gelebt haben, sehen sich zunehmend nicht politisch repräsentiert. Trotzdem ist der ANC weiterhin an der Macht. Die Organisation, die jahrzehntelang gegen Apartheid gekämpft hat, hat sich zum neuen demokratischen Südafrika in eine politische Partei umgewandelt und agiert heute in einem formellen Mehrparteiensystem, de facto aber in einem Kontext, der von einer einzigen Partei dominiert wird. Ranghohe Parteimitglieder nutzen zunehmend auch Praktiken der Mystifizierung, der Selbstzelebrierung, die sich auf eine glorreiche kämpferische Vergangenheit stützt, um teilweise von massiven Problemen wie die sich häufenden Korruptionsskandale abzulenken. Und wie wir nun auch gleich in dem Dokumentarfilm sehen werden, werden auch zunehmend populistische Hetzkampagnen gegen konstruierende Feinde der Regierung und der Partei, zum Beispiel gegen Journalisten, geführt. Populistische Rhetorik nimmt im öffentlichen Raum in Südafrika allgemein einen immer größeren Raum ein. Dies schließt sowohl rechts- als auch links populistische Elemente ein. Regelmäßig werden zum Beispiel von einer kleinen nationalistischen, burischen Minderheit Plädoyers für eine Rückkehr zu der sogenannten Rassentrennung, zu Apartheid gehalten. Plädoyers, die eine glorreiche Vergangenheit Südafrikas beschwören, in der vermeintlich es allen besser ging, auch der schwarzen Bevölkerung. Diese und andere völkische Diskurse werden zunehmend auch direkt oder zumindest in Teilen von politischen Parteien aufgegriffen, die sich selbst als mittig oder liberal bezeichnen würden. Ein zweites Beispiel in Bezug auf die Frage der Landverteilung, die aktuell im Parlament und im öffentlichen Raum in Südafrika debattiert wird. Da ist die Position, dass eine notfalls gewaltsame Enteignung weißer Grundbesitzer nach dem Vorbild Zimbabwes anzustreben sei. Das ist nicht untypisch als, ähm, als Position. Oder drittens, auf Twitter trendet und wütet der Hashtag Put South Africans First seit einigen Monaten. Es ist eine Hetzkampagne gegen afrikanische MigrantInnen, die sich klar auf Trumps America First Slogan bezieht. Menschen aus Mosambik, Zimbabwe, Nigeria und anderen afrikanischen Ländern, die in Südafrika leben und arbeiten, werden verbal angegriffen unter dem Vorwand, sie klauten SüdafrikanerInnen und Südafrikanern die Jobs und trügen zu erhöhter Kriminalität bei. Teilweise wird sogar zu Gewalt gegen sie aufgerufen. Ob nun also traditionell rechte Themen, beispielsweise die Beschränkung von Zuwanderung oder linke Themen, Beispiel Landbesitz und die Frage nach gerechter Umverteilung. Das Diskussionsklima wird zunehmend rauer und diese gesellschaftliche Polarisierung spiegelt sich auch in gewisser Weise in öffentlichen Diskursen wider. Die Frustration über weiter bestehende Ungleichheiten, unter denen besonders die schwarze Bevölkerung leidet, wird oftmals politisch für eigene Vorteile ausgeschlachtet sowohl in manchen Oppositionsparteien als auch in Teilen des ANC. 
In unserem Forschungsprojekt beschäftigen wir uns genau mit diesen aufgeworfenen Fragen und analysieren sowohl rechts- als auch linkspopulistische Kampagnen in Südafrika und anderen Ländern der Region aus einer vergleichenden Perspektive. Populismus ist natürlich ein umstrittener Begriff. Er ist oftmals ein Kampfbegriff, der politisch konnotiert ist. Wer würde sich schon selbst als Populistin oder als Populist bezeichnen? Eine zentrale These aus der Politikwissenschaft ist, dass populistische Akteure normalerweise eine Gegenüberstellung zwischen dem Volk und einer als korrupt wahrgenommenen Elite vornehmen. Nur genau hier stellt sich für Südafrika eine besonders spannende Frage. Wer ist denn überhaupt das Volk, das homogene Volk in Südafrika? Und was bedeutet es, wenn eine Regierungspartei ihre Legitimität aus einer in der Vergangenheit liegenden Befreiungskampfes bezieht? Ist sie dann Elite oder ist sie noch das Volk? Wir beobachten, dass diese Gegenüberstellung zwischen Volk und Elite in Südafrika sehr anders gestaltet ist als beispielsweise in Europa. Lokaler Kontext und regionale Geschichte sind wichtig für die jeweilige Ausprägung, Form oder Varianz von Populismus. Für den Kontext des südlichen Afrikas stellen wir uns deswegen viele, viele Fragen, auf die wir spezifische und regional sinnvolle Antworten suchen, zum Beispiel welche Relevanz haben geschichtliche Erfahrungen wie Apartheid und was sind deren Langzeitauswirkungen auf eine Gesellschaft? Welche Bedeutung hat das Konzept der Region, der geteilten regionalen Lebenserfahrung für Populismus und verschiedene Formen des Populismus? Und wie lernen populistische Akteure eigentlich voneinander innerhalb des südlichen Afrikas und im Austausch mit anderen Regionen? Wir haben das außerordentliche Glück, dass viele dieser Fragestellungen auch aus künstlerischer Perspektive behandelt werden. Zum Beispiel in dem Film, den wir nun gleich sehen werden. Ein paar kurze einführende Worte noch, ehe wir starten. How to Steal a Country ist 2019 gedreht worden und erzählt die Geschichte der Aufdeckung des größten Politskandals in Südafrika seit Ende der Apartheid, der sogenannten Gupta-Affäre die tiefgehende und korrupte Verflechtung zwischen Privatpersonen der Unternehmerfamilie der Guptas und regierenden Politikern aufgezeigt hat. Der Film ist aus Sicht von investigativen Journalistinnen und Journalisten erzählt, die an der Aufdeckung beteiligt waren und hat somit ein wenig das Format eines Real-Life-Thrillers, weil wie einige südafrikanische Kommentatoren sagen, das ist das Paradox, dass es schier unmöglich ist, über aktuelle südafrikanische Politik zu sprechen ohne dass der Bericht wie ein Thriller oder wie eine fiktionale Erzählung anmutet. Und nun vorab, ohne vorab zu viel zu verraten oder gar zu spoilern, ähm, würde ich gerne noch kurz auf ein paar Kernbegriffe eingehen, die im Film häufig vorkommen. Wie bereits erwähnt, wird der ENC eine wichtige Rolle einnehmen. Das ist die Regierungspartei, die seit 1994 alle südafrikanischen Präsidenten gestellt hat. Ein zweiter Begriff ist State Capture. State Capture beschreibt im südafrikanischen Kontext den Prozess der Vereinnahmung von staatlichen Strukturen und politischen Entscheidungen durch nicht demokratisch legitimierte und oft wirtschaftliche Akteure mit dem Ziel der privaten Bereicherung. Und der Begriff wird mittlerweile auch offiziell in der juristischen Aufarbeitung der Gupta-Affäre benutzt. Es wird außerdem die Rede sein von sogenannten State-Owned Enterprises, also staatlichen Unternehmen. Diese spielen eine Schlüsselrolle in Südafrika. Viele zentrale Infrastrukturbetreiber sind in staatlicher Hand. Ein wichtiges Unternehmen hier ist Transnet, der zentrale Betreiber von Eisenbahnen und Häfen im Land. Oder auch ESCOM, darüber werden wir bestimmt heute noch einmal sprechen, südafrikanisches Stromversorgungsunternehmen und größter Stromerzeuger in Afrika. Beide werden vom Ministerium für öffentliche Unternehmen, dem Department of Public Enterprises, kontrolliert und sind deswegen so wichtig, weil Veruntreuung von staatlichen Geldern in diesen wichtigen Infrastrukturbereichen gleich direkte Auswirkungen auf das Leben von Millionen Südafrikanerinnen und Südafrikanern hat. Wir freuen uns jetzt auf den Film How to Steal a Country. Schön, dass Sie heute Abend mit dabei sind. Nach dem Film treffen wir uns hier wieder, also ziemlich genau in 81 Minuten, das heißt, glaube ich, 20.35 Uhr, um mit dem Regisseur und äh, Professor Engel über den Film und weiterführende Fragen in, über Südafrika zu sprechen und zu diskutieren. Wir freuen uns darauf. Dann sage ich, Film ab.
welcome back uh, to Germany, I could say, um, from this virtual trip that we just took to South Africa and uh, across the globe, actually. I hope that uh, you enjoyed the documentary, if enjoying is the right word for such a um, difficult topic. Um, and that uh, many of you will remain with us now uh, for our discussion, despite the temptation of this very beautiful summer weather in Germany. So um, yeah, refill your tea or your cold drink and let's um, get ready for the discussion. We will switch to English now for the conversation with our two guests and um, I will introduce them in just a moment. A couple of organizational bits and pieces first. If you would like to follow the discussion in German, you can join us here in the Zoom room and hear the German translation by clicking on the little globe icon. And um, yeah, we will kick off this conversation with a couple of rounds of questions and would like um, then to open the floor and invite you also to address your questions to the speakers. So you can already get started, get your questions ready. Please feel free to put them in the chat on Zoom or on the YouTube channel and um, we will integrate them into the debate as we, as we go along. And you can write them in German or English as you wish. Mm -hmm. All right, um, we have two great guests with us uh, tonight. Um, let me firstly welcome the director of this film that we just saw, Rehat Desai. Um, Rehat is, uh, born, was born in Cape Town and is, has returned to South Africa from political exile in 1990. He now lives and works in Johannesburg, which at the moment I think is rather, is rather cold at this time of the year and is joining us uh, from there today. Um, Riyad has a master's in social history from the University of Witwatersrand and entered the TV and film industry as a current affairs journalist after completing his studies in 1997. He then moved on to focusing on historical and socio-political documentary films. And he has produced over 20 documentary films, many of them with international participation and that have received um, critical acclaim and wide festival take up, maybe just to mention um, the production Miners Shut Down on the Americana Massacre that was released in 2014 and that won, amongst other awards, um, an international Emmy for Best Documentary. Another film is Everything Must Fall on student protests in South Africa that was released in 2018. And How to Steal a Country is the last film of this trilogy and um, yeah, that's the one that we have just seen. So thank you so much, uh, Rehad, for being with us today. We hope that um, the connection will hold. Um, load shedding is real. We've noticed power cuts are a daily reality at the moment in South Africa and probably one of the clearest signs of the long-term consequences of state capture. We are also thrilled to have with us today Professor Dr. Ulf Engel. Ulf is professor for politics in Africa at Leipzig University and um, principal investigator of the research project Political Populism mm -hmm. in Southern Africa. He is also a visiting professor at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia and professor extraordinary at the Institute for Political Science at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. He wrote his PhD on the foreign policy of Zimbabwe and his habilitation on the Africa policy of the German Federal Republic between 1949 and 1999. And he works on uh, various issues surrounding the African Union, challenge, challenge, challenges in the field of peace and security and regional organizations in the global south. And uh, most importantly for today, he's a long-term fan, I would say, of South Africa and um, observer of um, South African politics. So a warm welcome to you two all. All right, um, Rihad, you have directed several films dealing with social protests in, in South Africa. We've just mentioned Miners Shut Down, for example. Why did you decide to film this movie, to make this movie about state capture? How does this fit into that uh, tradition of yours? Well, we needed to understand. Thank you once for inviting me for this. Uh, screening and uh, the discussion. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the, the film really was motivated by the desire to shine a spotlight uh, on the 
you know, what was at the time a very touch and go situation uh, around um, the survival, the political survival of Jacob Zuma, despite years of uh, investigations uh, and, and stories uh, about his network and his own dealings through his son and so on. It was becoming very brazen. And all of a sudden, the, the, the hard work of pioneering journalists who were under significant attack uh, bore fruition when all the evidence came forth in this massive leak, very similar to the Panama leak. And uh, I felt I had to do honor to the, to the journalists uh, and uh, to try and set the record uh, straight, if you like, the first draft of uh, history. Uh, we often call such documentaries, which, you know, span over a few years. And, um, you know, to, to put pay to this notion that somehow this force was a, a left wing, a, a socialist force, a, a radical economic force that was seeking to um, redistribute the wealth of the country. Well, they certainly were redistributing the wealth of the country uh, and it was into their own grubby pockets. Um, so, you know, TV is a wonderful medium to, to get into people's homes and to raise the questions that our society still needs to, to raise and answer uh, for us to truly uh, move on and uh, hopefully begin to fulfill some of the promises that democracy um, put on the table for our country. Um, you know, democracy is far more than simply ticking boxes every five years in a country such as ours, where there is such a, you know, hundreds of years of dispossession and colonialism. And really what we were seeing there was a continuation of that tradition under a new guise, a, a, an extracted, extractivist uh, project, which was dressed up as a, uh, a, a disruption to the status quo, to the greedy, rapacious, uh, white uh, capitalists. Now, capitalism is still uh, primarily uh, white in South Africa, uh, but it, its dynamic is far deeper than race. Um, here we saw the intersection between our racial past, our racial history, and the continued um, continuation of the status quo in a way. Uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, it was a short question, a long answer. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> the film um, Rehat ends with Zuma speaking before the Zondo Commission and maybe um, just for us here, what has happened in the meantime since you've since you screened, since you filmed the movie and today, because the inquiry into state capture is still is still ongoing. It can be followed by South Africans on a, on a daily basis. So maybe you can can you provide us with a with an update on what the situation is now and um, how far the state has come since uh, you shot the movie in bringing the responsible people to justice. Well. <clears throat> Zuma has refused to return to the Zondo Commission to answer further questions following a subpoena. It's now with the uh, uh, Constitutional Court and the National Prosecuting Authority whether to uh, uh, prosecute him for his failure to do so. Um, I believe he will have to um, return or, or he will face prosecution. He is still on prosecution on the arms deal, which involved a very established German company, uh, German-French company, arms company, Talas, 
or I'm not, not sure how you pronounce it uh, in Germany. Um, but uh, he, he will face those charges uh, very shortly. And there the money was piffling, uh, uh, of, 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 you know, $50,000 or something ridiculous. Um, the Freda dairy farm, where you saw um, uh, the farmer who, whose life was uh, then taken from him uh, for, for, for raising his voice on the matter, has uh, that case has come before us and the general secretary of the ruling party has now been suspended because he faced serious criminal charges um, and alongside him, the, comp the people behind the companies, which siphoned off uh, the equivalent of uh, 15, 20 million euro, um, have been come before court and denied bail. So these are the first serious prosecutions that are taking place following the State Capture Commission of the authors of the, certainly the political authors of this crime. Um, so uh, we hope uh, that they will continue to um, be unhindered in their work. They have a very sterling uh, prosecution team, very strong prosecution team in place uh, since uh, <clears throat> the change of political uh, office since Zoom has lost the elections at the ANC elective conference. And um, <clears throat> the Guptas now have an arrest warrant out for, their, uh, for them. The British have finally um, banned, barred any of their citizens working from the Guptas or the Guptas uh, entering the country. <clears throat> doing any business with these people. The SAP, the very big German software company, which gets a slight mention in the film, uh, has uh, fired some people, uh, and I think apologized. I'm not sure if they've paid back any money. <clears throat> but this involved all, a number of multinational corporations, very respectable corporations which are now uh, increasingly around the world involved with states such as ours um, uh, doing work for in the public sphere um, and, and doing it in a very unethical, immoral and often illegal manner. Corruption has become the new norm uh, internationally and this heist this massive industrial scale corruption cannot take place without uh, such players, uh, big players, often respected players, big auditing companies and so on, and, big, and the big banks are facilitating it. It always takes two to tango. Uh, we saw what happened in East Germany uh, with the privatization of the state assets. It's, uh, it's part of, often comes part and parcel of efforts to, uh, of the transition to democracy. Uh, privatization is part and parcel of that process. And with it, as you will know, Constance from Mozambique, massive levels of corruption often uh, accompany such processes. Again, a very long answer to a short question. Thank you, Rehat. And yes, uh, thank you all for mentioning SAP. And I think we will uh, come back to those transnational entanglements and, and actors that also play a role um, a bit later on. So we are quite uh, deep, I would say, in the, in the subject matter now already. Um, maybe we can uh, speak a, a little bit about um, the ANC as well. The film shows um, quite vividly, I, I think, how parts of the former liberation movement and now governing party 
has um, today, yeah, is today in a position to compromise the quality of life of, of millions of people through, through that corruption. And um, Ulf, from um, the perspective of someone who has studied the ANC as an, as an organization, um, what, how, how would you explain this? What, what has happened over the last 27 years within the ANC as an organization for these developments to become so prominent? Well, thank you, Constanze. This is actually a question I would like to give back to uh, Rehat, of course, but uh, to start with, maybe with an attempt of an answer. Uh, I guess we've seen across South Africa a similar pattern of liberation movements taking power, some of them being elected and enjoying quite a level of legitimacy, um, starting with Zimbabwe in 1980, Namibia, and, and all of that, and before that, even. Angola and Mozambique, but um, the common pattern really is that state capture has become the only game in town. Um, and under conditions of so-called primitive accumulation, there is no way outside of the state to accumulate capital. So capturing the state and distributing uh, perks and funds and all of that through the networks has become a dominant uh, pattern quite uh, common across the region. And within the ANC, we see different factions and all of that. And um, there are various ways in which they are connected. And I, I would like to actually ask Rehat what his take is on um, how it developed. I mean, you quoted the example of Zuma taking 50,000 as a bribe in the Talis deal, in the arms deal of almost 25 years ago. So he wasn't in for big money in those days, but he was, of course, getting the bribe and accepting that. So what has triggered the situation from that uh, situation to where we are now uh, with really large scale um, state capture? We're talking about 50 billion uh, rand that have been taken from different uh, state owned enterprises. Uh, and so, how come would be my first question? And also, maybe uh, to Rehard, um, in, in that movie that was already mentioned on Marikana, one of the persons heavily implicated was Ramaphosa, the current president. He played a dubious role, some would argue. And he is kind of linked through that, in, at least in your trilogy of movies to uh, state capture Zuma. And that raises the question of the heart of the ANC, where it stands now and what the different uh, factions are and, and how, what is your take on that, actually? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, a very good question of, um, I think you're right. Um, in a, a country which sort of adopts the, the notion that there is no alternative uh, to capitalism and didn't take the opportunities that were afforded the country to redistribute wealth in the early days when it had the political will and political authority to do so. You saw the, the monopolies, the big five companies that control you know, 70 to 80 percent still of the South African economy essentially uh, become more profitable and uh, co opt the a very small group of beneficiaries of, you know, it's called broad economic uh, empowerment or black economic empowerment, uh, but people call it. Uh, politically economic empowerment, uh, the PEE, -E, not BEE. -E. And uh, this has meant that a handful of uh, top you know, level politicians became very, very rich uh, over the course of uh, 10 years. This policy was pioneered uh, by the big corporations, by the, the mining companies, in order to secure and to deracialize capitalism, to delink the system 
uh, of the economy uh, from the political and social setup. Uh, and, and because people were making the link in the 80s at the height of the liberation struggle between um, the economy and the racial exploitation. Uh, the view that won out was that, well, really all we needed to do was to grow the economy. And in the growth of the economy, if, if we went easy and uh, provided the environment for the growth, the lowering, lowering of taxes, corporate taxes and so on, capital gains taxes, what we would see would be a trickle down of wealth. Now this didn't happen. In fact, there was more wealth uh, inside uh, white ha households uh, than today than there was uh, 20 years ago. Um, and, and perhaps more importantly, there's a higher concentration of wealth in, in fewer hands. You know, the two richest uh, industrialists in the country, Ivan Strasberg and uh, uh, Anton Rupert, own as much as the uh, bottom 50% of the South African population, two people. Now, in the context of rising unemployment and so on, people, the, the political elite, have just, you know, the, 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 the African National Congress has become a vehicle to access uh, state contracts. The state economy we inherited was relatively large and it still remains 25, 30% of the total uh, amount of, of, of economic activity in the country. So access to the state uh, and, and to the top politicians like many other African countries has become a critically important strategy for entrepreneurs, black entrepreneurs. And they have really uh, gone into the African National Congress and uh, They've made it legitimate to become rich alongside some very well known and respected, formerly respected uh, heroes from the liberation struggle, Ramaphosa being one of them. Um, and this has meant that the, you know, the majority, most, certainly a large number of the provinces. Uh, in the ANC, the nine provinces, have been paralyzed because of the fights over the spoils that come from state power. And it's, my view is that the, the party uh, will be unable to renew itself, to rejuvenate itself politically, to find a vision for society. To, to find a way um, to do what it promised uh, in, while it retains power. While, while it has power, it will continually be, de be, de be, de be deviled by the opportunists who are seeking to enrich themselves. And uh, as you say, you know, with a highly monopolized economy, that's the only way the black middle class can get a real foot up in society. Uh, and we're seeing, I think we're, we're approaching, we're entering into a process of a, of a failed state. You look at the levels of unemployment, you look at the levels of corruption, you look at the failure of our health system to uh, combat the, the, the health burden, the burden of disease, which has been massively placed under stress by COVID. You look at the failure of the education system, the failure of the, the, the transport system. People can't get trains anymore because uh, for, for numerous reasons, mainly to do with 
corruption scandals around the security of the of the lines uh, you know they've been gutted they can't operate anymore we've got a situation where taxi violence uh, is at all high, very high levels and um, the failing economy has really been tipped over the edge by the pandemic uh, to so we're not going to get the the growth that we require to produce the revenue to pay for the social grants and the, the other mechanisms of delivery, you know, the, the social services and so on. So it's, you know, people are estimating or approximating by 2030, there'd be very little left of the South African state. We thought we would be an exception to the rest of Africa. Um, that we could keep it uh, clean, um, that we would somehow, given the strength of civil society, which it, unfortunately is extremely weak, um, together with you know the trade unions and so on, we would be able to counter these tendencies. Uh, and, and keep the country on the straight and narrow. And I think that those illusions are increasingly being blown out of the window. So, yeah, uh, there we are. And um, Ulf, I think your microphone is still on mute. It is. Thank you so much. In the past, obviously, growth rates have never translated into any kind of redistribution. And we've seen the income inequality even increasing after the end of apartheid. Now, outside of that economic realm, there is still hope and trust somehow into chapter nine institutions, the public protector, at least the previous one, the courts, commissions of inquiry, now Zondo. How do you see that? What, what is your... Uh, assessment of the legal system dealing with state capture? The, unfortunately, these are political problems. Um, and that there aren't any legal panaceas, legal solutions for that. Um, the, the chapter nine institutions uh, have limited funding and have a limited remit. Uh, we, we see, we, we have a problem where, uh, you know, the, the, the winner takes all. So the president, you know, who, who's to say, you know, while Ramaphosa is technically clean and he plays it but by the game, um, he has, uh, an extremely strong uh, backlash happening against him from the more corrupt elements in, in the ANC. And if he loses power, then the next president comes in and has tremendous power over parliament, over the appointment of ministers, over the appointment to the, of, of these chapter nine institutions the appointment of the public protector and so on. Um, so unfortunately there's, you know, this, this, this view in South Africa that our constitution, a model constitution in many ways uh, it, it can save us. All we've got to do is somehow wave the book around and remind them of what the constitution states. The, the reality, uh, in society, and I believe across the world, is things only really can be safeguarded when we have strong movements, when the balance of forces are in favor of people's organizations, the civic structures, the trade union structures, the student structures, the teachers' organizations, the, the public sector, uh, organizations that the, the the civil service it takes many years 
many, many decades to build a strong civil service. It takes many, many decades to build a strong democracy. And the, the, you need a context which is conducive to that. And the context for Europe has been economic growth to build in the advanced democracies, the advanced capitalist countries has been economic growth. Uh, but with economic downturn, with economic decline, we have seen these tendencies towards authoritarianism, towards corruption, towards uh, misgovernance, mis bad governance, take hold everywhere. The, the merging of the public and the private spheres in life, not knowing who's public, who's private, who's really acting in our interests, what these agencies, these regulation, regulatory authorities and so on are supposed to be doing, who they're staffed by, where the conflict of interests are. We saw in Germany with VW, we saw what happened there. Um, we've seen a massive fraud take place in Germany. Germany is no exception. It's not top of the table when it comes to corruption. Um, but um, this is an international phenomenon we're dealing with. Uh, the, the only difference in South Africa is the, the stakes are much higher. The, um, the people's lives, the, the, the very basics of life, water, health, security, are all being com uh, completely undermined alongside most countries in the global south. It's, it's happening in elsewhere, but to a lesser extent, as I would, I would argue, of maybe you disagree with me. Damn it. Uh, if I just may one more question and uh, shut up. Um, I, I'm sympathetic with the view of uh, civics, trade unions, all of that. And South Africa has had a very vibrant, resilient civil society ever since under apartheid, of course. Now, in the recent uh, elections and uh, looking forward to the next local government elections, what we've also seen is that many of the eligible voters, especially the young people, no longer go to uh, take part in elections. They by now outnumber those who are voting ANC. Isn't there a contradiction between your hope on civics on the one hand and changing things uh, through the ballot box? Yes, uh, I think it's a healthy uh, contradiction, a healthy tension. Uh, I think we're seeing marginalization happening uh, amongst the younger people uh, across the world. Uh, we're seeing how groups, you know, uh, at the lower end of our social spectrums, uh, losing any, any faith in politics, turning to authoritarian right wing uh, alternatives. Uh, the, the growth of xenophobia in South Africa is rising exponentially as we speak. On June 16th, I think there's going to be uh, some big eruptions in, in Soweto. Uh, action uh, first, or South, Action South Africa, uh, a split off from the Democratic Alliance, deeply xenophobic, will contest and will we'll get a big amount of votes uh, in, in the coming local elections at the end of the year similar phenomenon to uh, Europe and, and particularly Germany again. The, 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 your question specifically, um, I think, you know, we've got to view, and I think this is the problem with the emerging alternatives, uh, with all their problems, uh, certainly the left alternatives, the, uh, what we would call the politically progressive alternatives, is they have a preoccupation 
with elections and uh, whether they state it or not, um, believe their only option really is uh, the, the whole orientation is, is political power through the ballot box. And therefore the whole orientation uh, becomes focused on that to the detriment of building a popular voice, um, building you know, st student organization across political lines, for instance, uh, trade union organization across political identities. Uh, our civic movement has been ripped asunder because of these political identities. Our trade union movement has been ripped asunder because of these uh, political identities. And uh, we've, we've got to learn to become bigger, but to quote uh, an, a, a one European, uh, someone whose work I've always found fascinating, Antonio Gramsci, the old is dying, but the new is yet to be born. And in the process, we are seeing the birth of monsters. Okay, <laughs> that is a good moment uh, for me, a very provocative moment to encourage uh, the people listening to listening to us to also don't hesitate to put their questions in the chat um, on the YouTube channel. Um, please feel free to engage with us. In the meantime, one yeah, one very fascinating thing. I think about the ANC are these these different factions and yes these entanglements between the state the party and the economy is is something as as you said Rihard it's not necessarily specific to South Africa but it's a it's a, it's a global phenomenon now if you look at the ANC mm, you were quite pessimistic in terms of um, the developments of the party um, especially if you've mentioned um, the Secretary General Ace Mahashule, who was just uh, suspended. And then I think the health minister was also put on leave this week uh, by the president because of ongoing corruption charges, but or, or corruption um, allegations. Um, my question would be, do you see any corner or any faction that could provide hope or from which there could be a dynamic of a renewal or a positive change within the ANC. Not doesn't have to be related to one person, but in, in general, do you see elements within the party that, um, yeah, that can give a little bit of hope um, and that also look at inner party renewal? Well, let me widen it. African nationalism has historically been a progressive force. And in some ways, at some, at some point, sometimes now even fighting for the, for the uh, patents on COVID technologies, COVID vaccines to be shared, is really fighting the good fight, fighting for international equality. Um, you know, the Indian nationalists, even you know how disgusting you know, Modi's politics are. Uh, we have to support Indi the Indian state, the South African state, uh, leading these efforts. The, um, the, the, there are the, the, the impulse behind the ANC's continued support lies in the hopes and desires and, and the need for people to lift themselves out of dire poverty to lift themselves out of the margins where they feel they will, will, will you know, the, the, there is a, a huge fear amongst the working poor, those who have jobs in the informal economy and those who are active in the informal economy, that, that they will drop to the bottom and have to scrape the, you know, the, the leftovers uh, from the bottom of, of the barrel in order to survive. And, and that fear of poverty even is there in the lower middle class and so on. 
So the, 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 the need for a cohesive and coherent force, united force, which brings the, this impulse for change together is critical. Now, inside that spectrum of nationalism, of African nationalism, uh, you know, you, you, we have the, the left nationalists under the economic freedom fighters. Now their base is primarily young and that's critical because there is no movement without young people. Their leadership is bereft uh, of any real vision. It is really uh, duplicating uh, what the leadership of the African National Congress is doing. And that is in many ways, uh, the accumulating resources uh, for, its, for their own. They're looking uh, in their own self-interest. This is the problem really with the political problem with that, that project. Nationalism is a middle-class project. It's a project where the middle class attempt to lift themselves up through uh, state developmental, so-called state developmental objectives, mirroring the, the, uh, the, the path of development of the advanced capitalist countries and so on to, to, to raise their fortunes. So I, I, my confidence is in the instinct, the gut instinct of South Africans to stand up and to fight and to, and to protest. We have huge levels of protest in South Africa and they're rising again very quickly over the last uh, few weeks as we're seeing the lack of vaccine, rising unemployment, uh, power cuts intensify and so on. Uh, whole communities being without electricity for weeks and months on end, people are just getting tired. So that's um, it's it that's the social force which has the ability to to renew the political landscape of South Africa, and it still requires a significant renewal. Uh, it still needs its own political expression. Um, and to do that, it has to transcend the very real limits of, of, of nationalism, of African nationalism. I, I do agree, Riyad, um, for, for that particular momentum that is there right now, but it needs to be channeled or find its own expression to translate into a political movement or to revive existing movements. And I guess for that reason, the forthcoming local elections are so crucial. And uh, oftentimes it's being built up at the local level again to become something of a more national force. I I'm not sure about the plan here, Constanze, whether you have any questions from the audience, but if I may um, just have a more personal question to Rehard, on, on the naming of this documentary. I mean, we've seen many uh, investigative journalists publishing uh, tremendously important accounts over the recent years, Peter Lewis Milberg, Jacques Pau, Albert Shipkin and others. But the title of your movie is Robin Rennick's How to Steal a Country. Now, Rennick being the former British High Commissioner to South Africa, is that a coincidence or was that a deliberate choice? Um, a, a local journalist uh, g gave, the, or maybe his sub-editor, gave the title for his article, uh, How to Steal a Country, and I thought that was a great title. This was before that Renwick, that rubbish, that conservative uh, publicist, self-publicist, produced his book, uh, which I thought was uh, really <coughs> poor piece of writing, poor account, uh, and, and very egocentric. So nothing to do with that book. And given the fact that uh, documentaries 
uh, have far, far wider circulation uh, than uh, such books. We knew that uh, ours, our name would become the dominant name and we wouldn't have to worry about Google searches, search optimization engines and so on. So uh, we, we just remain confident in our ability for the, the documentary to overshadow that uh, very poor right-wing propaganda that uh, was produced. Which, which at least had the support of uh, Private Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but what is your next project? I'm uh, currently producing a documentary. Hopefully it'll be out by the end of the year. Uh, latest, the beginning of next year. Uh, I started a project looking at the uh, some of the revolutionary new biomedical technology around the HIV vaccine. Mm -hmm. And um, in the process, I mean, this was being led by um, leading scientists, both in South Africa and in America in particular, uh, Tony Fauci and uh, so on in, in America, uh, his NIH and the groups of people have been, Barney Graham's who helped develop the technology, the mRNA technology, which is making your German companies so rich. Uh, this, this technology was Critical in its uh, development, and it's happened through HIV. Anyway, it's really looking at the intersection. What have we learned from the HIV pandemic? Is it any of it being applied? What what is what isn't? What is the, what are the tensions between the politics and science? Um, and really, the it's a combination of an essay combined with a story. Uh, around uh, how my subjects that I've been following for, for months uh, get overtaken by the COVID pandemic um, and um, how they get into hot water with their respective governments and uh, the fight for vaccine equity against vaccine apartheid, uh, the, what's happened to public health over the last uh, 40, 50 years, from the declaration of Alma Atta uh, in the 70s, where Kennedy and the Americans were all very uh, together with the rest of the world around health being a human right, and how that shifted the increasing power of the big pharma, big pharmaceutical companies, uh, to a situation where we found the trade related aspects of intellectual property coming into being trips and how this was used to uh, bully and badger and cajole countries into stopping production or export uh, or, or certainly of generic drugs uh, around the world, how Brazil and India were really hammered. And this is really a, a massive setback when we're seeing millions of lives at stake today. You know, we're going back to be able to understand why we're in this position today. So that's yeah, going well, um, but it's a tough one. It's, it's combining essay with story, uh, plot, character, argumentation. Uh, not an easy one. Well, as we are speaking, India and South Africa are present at the G7 summit in Cornwall, trying to make that point. Let's see, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our audience is still um, silent. Um, <laughs> essentially watching a European championship uh, match a parallel to this event. <laughs> so before, um, I think we're coming to the end of our discussion. Um, I would like, I also would have one, I guess, more, more, more personal question that also was a little bit the, the, 
the red thread or the, the, the framework um, for, for this event today. Um, so Riyad, you, you also, you studied social history. You just mentioned that this tension between science and politics is something that you, you're quite intrigued about. Um, so a, a question, I guess, to, to, to both of you, Rehat and Ulf, um, what do you see, um, oh, okay, well, put it easy, can activism, political activism and research in academia go together? And where do they have to keep distance and where can they, do they need to support each other a little bit more? Well, I'll just have a quick one. I mean, maybe we have a bit of a back and forth between me and Olaf on this, but, you know, I, I was being active in, the, I got active in climate politics, uh, climate change politics, maybe about 12 years ago. Um, and then we were very, very deferential towards science. Uh, we didn't understand that it's inherently conservative um, because of the need for, uh, what's the word, or if, um, when we're talking about natural science, for convention, really. You don't step yeah. out. Yeah. You know, it, it tends towards to be very conservative. Therefore, we were very careful about, we were told we have to be very careful, always have to be in line with science. Um, uh, when we make our arguments about the climate. The climate, the, the scientists are now telling us that uh, certainly the better ones, that we've got to stand up. We're in a very serious situation. We're facing another, we're facing the biggest existential threat. And I think um, research agendas Academia has to now, more than any time before, and they did it in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They were the first to produce a paper which, which described the process of state capture in South Africa, joining the dots by Mark Swilling and a few others, after the Pravin Gordon, the, the minister who was fired, said, you know, people need to join the dots. And the academics took up the challenge and joined the dots and produced a very compelling argument around what was happening in South Africa and the processes. That gave incredible confidence to journalists, to activists, to the legal profession, to the chapter nine institutions, to some parliamentarians to step up. The academia is generally part of the establishment, part of the status quo, and have increasingly become so. If you see the outrageous salaries that the vice chancellors are getting paid, certainly in African countries <coughs> and elsewhere, they've almost become part of the ruling elite. The corporatization of the universities how the universities are serving first and foremost the private agendas. These have to be challenged by progressive academics. This has to be, we, we need a research agenda which is based on the public interest first and foremost. We have to fight back and we have to join with activists uh, to, to find that hope, and to find that inspiration because without them, uh, without the rest of civil society, uh, the voices, the fine and solid research that's produced with integrity and sweat and labor, hard labor of academics will go to waste. That was a bit of a speech, I'm sorry. <laughs> <coughs> but I guess we've always seen that, be it from Verrichte Afrikaner who joined the struggle or opened bridges and all of that uh, to today's talk about decolonizing the curriculum and more of that. I can see it's pretty cold in Joburg, it must be. Uh, it, it's a matter of finding alliances, building up things, continuing the struggle, defining the agenda and hoping for 
some feedback, positive one, from existing uh, political representation. It, it's a cumbersome, slow struggle. It's a fight within the fight yeah. we have to have within our universities. But, you know, I, I, I'm very inspired by the the bridges, the networks are being built around the decolonization agenda, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been very inspiring to watch and to be part of to uh, my last film, Everything Must Fall. Um, there are things happening. There is a new zeitgeist uh, building up, I think, and it's COVID, I think, has woken people up to the need for certainly strong, fortified public health systems for more accountable, uh, transparent political uh, authority and for a, a more responsive uh, government, the, 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 the climate crisis as well. But, you know, it's great to see a program like yours, which works on social cohesion, because what we're seeing in the process is big divides open up in our society mm. where those of us who are privileged to have higher levels of education uh, are miles away from those who are getting less and less opportunity to, to move ahead and to, to meet their aspirations in any way. Um, and we need political alternatives. We need vision more than ever. We need, uh, and the academy allows us, encourages us, the university in its essence, certainly in the way I define, want to define it, is, is there to, to think freely to think imaginatively, to think with innovation, to read widely. And I think people are going back to these, some of the older texts and through reworking these, uh, developing a new understanding of these texts with the new context they face, rereading in, in a way which we never, reinterpreting the books, if you like, that, that we read yesteryear. And uh, it's great to see, you know, a young, at long last, a young cohort of fine minds come through the university, uh, as it did in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and I think we're gonna be dependent on that cohort of people to get us out of this mess because mine and Ulf's generation uh, have uh, failed to, and are failing to uh, provide what's required at this moment, a new way, a new vision. I can certainly see where you're coming from, uh, Gramsci and building up a new hegemon in society. Um, indeed, we are same generation, I think we're just one year apart. I'd like to thank you very much for your, not just the, the documentary, but uh, engaging with us tonight and sharing so many important points. So thank you all. Thank you, Constance. Yes. Real pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful um, to have both of you here discussing. And um, yeah, personally, I'll keep in mind the phrase, we need a struggle within the struggle for both, I guess, universities and mm. for civil society um, as well. So, Rihard, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Ulf, as well. And um, yeah, all the best um, for, your, for your next uh, projects um, and um, yeah, and all the future work uh, in this, in this um, important field. And thank you also, um, just to close the session to everyone participating, everyone listening to us. Um, keep in touch and stay tuned also for the upcoming events uh, of the Globe 21 Festival uh, via Twitter or the festival website. So thank you so much again and um, have a good night.
Thank you. Look forward to being in person with you at some stage in the future. Yes, yes. <laughs> Same here. Ich bin Veronique und ich koordiniere das Forschungsprojekt Recalibrating Africanistic. Hi, ich bin Brady und zusammen haben wir den Videopodcast Africanists Assemble gestartet. Alle unsere vielen Mitwirkenden arbeiten im Bereich der Afrika-Studien und jeden Monat antworten sie auf eine Frage in einem kurzen Audioclip, den sie uns ganz einfach per WhatsApp oder E-Mail zuschicken. Und aus allen Clips zusammen wird dann die fertige Folge. So wollen wir ein zugängliches Format schaffen, um uns auszutauschen und voneinander zu lernen. Ganz ohne das Schreiben von Essays und Zoom-Konferenzen mit wackeligen Internetverbindungen. Vielen Dank, dass wir dabei sein dürfen und viel Spaß mit der Pilotfolge von Africanists Assemble.